Okay, colleagues, I'm a medical historian, so let's start really way back with this cuneiform plaque. Um, cuneiform is one of the most ancient kinds of human script. It's over seven millennia old, colleagues, so really a very, very ancient kind of writing. And this plaque was discovered, um, it's from ancient Sumeria, modern day Iran and Iraq. And unfortunately, the, the knowledge and the expertise to decipher cuneiform, um, we lost that about four millennia ago. And then, um, fast forward to the late 19th century, and there was a very concerted effort among people who were into code, into things like hieroglyphics, to start to translate these plaques that were found in places like Persia, places like Iran. And they made a breakthrough in 1908 with deciphering a cuneiform plaque. And social historians like myself um, were very excited by this because it turns out that these are some of the most ancient pieces of human script that are neither bureaucratic, they have nothing to do with government, really, or religious. They're kind of idioms, they're sayings about um, our lived experiences as humans. So let me translate then what the plaque said. Our earth is degenerate in these later days. There are signs that the world is speedily coming to an end, bribery and corruption are common, and children no longer obey their parents. This is a very, very ancient idea, colleagues. It's something that's been around for a great deal of time, and it's something that we're grappling with very much in the present. However, let me also make an argument for novelty. HIV is a modern epidemic, it emerged as an epidemic in the 20th century, and our response has also been fundamentally uh, defined by uh, 20th century global health politics. I'm think here, thinking here about the Elma Atta Accord, the emergence of models like uh, community-based medicine, family-based medicine, and um, people like the Cox, the Sasses in the Polela model in 1940s Durban, South Africa. And um, for the first time in history with HIV, we have a global movement of activists who, with researchers, many of whom are in the room today, made a concerted effort, made a demand for public universal access to a relatively advanced, comprehensive tertiary kind of medicine. And governments came on board, the private sector came on board, we had the establishment of massive bilateral aid agencies and programs. This is really unique um, in human history that we've had this kind of, of intervention. The evidence base, everyone, as we know, is utterly vast and it is ever proliferating. I think a lot of us here will spend those precious hours that we have between uh, conducting primary research or doing programming, uh, scrolling through the Journal of the International Aid Society, very, very good at sending emails these days. Salutes out to um, our editorial boards there. Um, and trying to keep up to date with this vast evidence base. So if I can just make another kind of historical intervention to look at an overarching sense of what has changed. Initially, there was a great focus on access. We wanted to have an evidence base to prove empirically that provision of antiretroviral treatment was going to work not just in Manhattan or Berlin, it was going to work in Lusaka, it was going to work in Agincourt, it was going to work in rural Malawi, etc. And so a lot of the, the focus, the research was devoted to proving that access was going to be of health benefits, even in resource-constrained contexts. Also to proving, bless Michelle Kazachkin and our friends in the, the Global Fund, it was not only a human rights imperative or a health imperative, it was also a cost imperative. It made real economic sense to treat people rather than letting them die um, painfully and expensively in the years to come. Fast forward. In some ways, lots of caveats here, we have solved the problem of access. I think all of us here are convinced that access is non-debatable, it's benefits. But what about adherence? Now that we have had such a massive, rapid scale-up of treatment, how are we going to retain this, this group of patients, many of whom are in resource-constrained context, many of whom who are adolescents, how are we going to get them into care and then keep them in care lifelong? This is a really kind of fundamental, novel challenge that we're facing. 
Right, everyone. So that's by way of kind of framing my argument. Let me now, um, in the spirit of a workshop, I'd like to present some really kind of nascent emerging findings from the Mzansi Wako study, and I'd like to focus on three themes. Um, the first is the issue of proxy patients. Um, and I'm bringing these up because I think the literature here um, is scant. And although there are people like Lee Faley and others who have written quite copiously about this, these are some topics that I think we should start to be discussing more and that we need more research about. The second theme is what I call the comply or die ultimatum and the compliance ultimatum. And then thirdly, on positive gender dynamics, how we can harness the new relations, new um, relations between young men and women in ways that could serve programming um, and serve the health outcomes of um, adolescents. Oh, sorry. Okay, quickly about Mzansi Wako then. Um, I think the, the principal point about Mzansi Wako is that it is mostly extra clinical. We've seen a, a extraordinary base of evidence from, coming from studies like IPREX, voice, breather, large multi-site randomized controlled trial studies about the clinical adherence behaviors of adolescents. But as my colleague and friend Lucy likes to say, studying adherence at a clinic is a bit like studying truancy at schools. A lot of these kids are either not coming to clinics or they initially came and are then potentially delinked from services. So we're using a number of methods, but the principal message here is that it is a community-based, community-traced study that seeks to explore the risk and protective factors for antiretroviral adherence, the lived experiences of HIV-positive teenagers, and what policy and programming can potentially learn from this. Our research design then, as I've said, is mixed methods. There's a qualitative component. There's a quantitative component. We've been going since late 2012, early 2013. We've completed the baseline and the second wave. We're full, t uh, full throttle third wave at the moment, everyone. And we've had continuous qualitative research, participatory research throughout. Um, so you can see here then that our total sample number is just over one and a half thousand adolescents. We also have about a third status unknown or negative, what I like to call zero assorted. And an explicit purpose of this research has been to leverage the perspectives of adolescents into the policy arena to take the lessons and the messages that we've, we've learned from participatory research using a range of different kinds of media and performative uh, visual methods and to bring them into the policy sphere. So we work quite closely with UNICEF, with a number of government departments and with a number of bilaterals. There's an issue, uh, sorry, an image from our baseline sample. Okay, colleagues, the study setting in the Eastern Cape. I wanted to dwell on this a little bit because it comes back to the issue of, of a lot of research being clinic, clinically focused. And that's by necessity as well as by, by the logistical challenges. Professor Linda Gale has written about this. The very serious operational, logistical, and ethical challenges that inhere in doing research with adolescents, both within facilities but very much outside of facilities too. And also the issue then of representativity. These contexts, often our research findings are coming from rich world contexts, affluent contexts with better access to health resources, better counseling, um, all kinds of bells and whistles, even attachment to a university, which is not the case um, within many other contexts with the rollout. So that's why basically we're, we are founded in the Eastern Cape, um, where um, the rollout happens quite a lot later. In the Western Cape, it began in 1999 through PMTCT. In the Eastern Cape, really only big numbers from 2005 onwards. And it's more representative of a kind of regional dispersion, local... Uh, uh, rural, peri-urban or urban facilities, you can see this is an image of some of the different neighborhoods that we work in, about 170 different neighborhoods. 
Um, I'm talking here about the transition from Bantustan care that was during apartheid health policies when resources were concentrated for a particular wide racial group in well-resourced context in metropolitan areas. And of course, since 1994, my colleague Gwen was speaking about this earlier, a massive revolutionary change in transforming the health sector. Over a thousand clinics opened in the Eastern Cape um, since 1994. So we can see a big shift in trying to transform how, how care is provided from hospitals to community health care centers. And that has lots of interesting kind of regional um, empirical uh, findings and messages for, for other kinds of health care contexts. When we started the study, our HIV um, provincial prevalence was just over 11%. And as you can see here, colleagues, this is such a familiar image, I think, is here is a nurse, it's nurse-managed ART provision, and what is she doing? Who can I pick on? <laughs> She's filling out a register, isn't it? Nurses and registers. They had so many registers in this facility, they had a register to keep track of the registers. I also wanted to point out here, it's an issue of the chairs. Here you can see the chairs. These are the kinds of places in which we sit. Um, three different chairs there. The last is inside an adolescent's home. And those are the kinds of places where we sat and listened and did the interviews. Um, I think one of the real joys of this work was that it is pr principally research. We try not to intervene, of course, for issues of desirability and bias. And so one of our, our sayings on the research then, often to our students is, don't just do something, sit there. We're trying to use a real diversity of data, and let me take you through this quite briefly, and I wanted to really use images so you have a sense of, of the different kinds of engagements that we're having. On the top right-hand corner, this is how it looks in, in one of the streets um, in the neighborhoods in which we do these interviews in the adolescents' homes, and what you can see is a child who's wearing a pink hat, and he's scoping out the street. He's looking at who's coming and going, who's visiting. So when you pitch up in um, a branded van with a checkboard and go and do a visit, your neighbors start asking questions. What's putting? Why are you having this visit? Potentially, are there access to resources? These are the kinds of ethical issues that arise in, in community-traced or community-based research. And therefore, it was a necessity for us to include another part of the sample who are HIV negative or unknown, so that we don't identify everyone in the sample just on the basis of connecting the dots that they would all be HIV positive. Our researchers are young locals. This is how they look and they do a lot of work in youth health facilities um, most of the observations happen in people's homes or in their leisure spaces here's a taxi rank so places where people meet thoroughfares where they do their shopping where they hang out and jaw, as we say in South Africa and our point was to then really get inside people's lives and let them air their dirty laundry let them be honest with our, with us without any ramifications of moralizing or getting into trouble um, or being told off about their real behaviors okay here is a series of images of different experiences, different ways that clinical services are mapped and then understood. And I've given two, two sources and um, references that use these materials. The first, it's little, but this is a design of a hospital. And if you can see those words in the middle, that's the play area. So you can see how this has been drawn up and drafted and designed from the, from the kind of architects or the people who are, who are designing and constructing the service. The middle slide, is an image then of the same facility with a quite bewildering series of arrows about where you must go, which direction you must go. You can either go right or left according to the arrows, except it's a maze, it's a labyrinth of different resources that teenagers have to negotiate. And if you look on the right then, that's a, an image that one of our teenagers has drawn of the facility, a dream clinic. And I think what's really interesting, the difference is here, the teenager has drawn himself, he's drawn the road that he comes from, and he's imagined very different um, facilities and he's imaged people, he's included people, um, included water tanks, I think Professor Reese was speaking about that this morning. So we have a sense of how adolescents are perceiving and understanding health services and how they are understood in kind of another formal imprint, another kind of map. 
Now let me come, colleagues, to the crux of my presentation. And initially in Mzansi Wako, we, we come up with this hypothesis. We hypothesized that good adherence, of course, is socially determined, and we thought it would be as a result of a kind of triumvirate of care, different actors. And let me just say a shout out to our colleagues from Karolinska. I wanted to include this image here of really good Scandi design. This tripod, the tripod is meant to be a caregiver, an adolescent, and a health worker. They must work together in order for there to be good health outcomes. But what we found, oh, sorry. Oh, help me, Wilco. That's it, thank you. What we've in fact found is more of a lattice. So I've included here a doily, um, one of our South African uh, favorite means of decor, on a table, and this is an image I took with um, some ARC on top of the doily. Really, it's much more of a lattice. There are all kinds of socio-cultural and structural factors that are um, replete within an adolescent's health behaviors, if they're going to be able to adhere, how they use sexual health, and how they perform. Um, in, um, in their lives. Okay, now to the issue of proxy patients. I've not, seen, I've not seen anything about this. Colleagues, if there's a literature on this, please let us engage about it. What we have found is that a lot of adolescents might begin um, treatment um, through uh, disclosure, through diagnosis within a facility, but very often there is a kind of a mediator, a caregiver. And here's an image I took from a family album, a photo album, where you have one of our uh, young participants, 14 years old, and his great auntie, who's been responsible for him, who's brought him into care, overseen his initiation, and, and really mediates how it is that he accesses the facilities and goes on his behalf to facilities to fetch his medicines, right? We're talking here about proxy patients. But at that visit, the healthcare worker also asks questions about this young man's, you know, how are his sores, how is his growth, what is his weight like? And this woman, well into her 70s, has got to remember and recall and report on behalf of this adolescent for whom she is principally responsible as a caregiver. Of course, she's, she is not the only caregiver. If we're looking at different kinds of kinship structures, you know, often in these, in these kinds of families, the idea of the nuclear primary caregiver child doesn't graft on so well. So this young man spends weekends and weeks with his granny, but for holidays he goes to his older brother who takes care of different kinds of resources and oversees his health in very different ways. So what we've done very quickly, and let me apologize to Elona and Lucy, this data is not just raw, colleagues. This data is still in the ground. It's growing, right? It is still sprouted data. We pulled it straight from SPSS. And in essence, what, what I wanted to show you, I've, put, I've designed it like this so you can see that it came from an email. I've not fiddled with the, with the table too much. In essence, this is a question we ask in the survey, 32 measures and constructs. This is one of the questions that we ask on um, adherence practices. Who picks up your ARV pills? Right, this is the question that we ask to 11 to 19 year olds, um, about 1,000 HIV positive teens. Myself, 341. Family member without me, 260 or so. Family member and me, 300 plus. So we're seeing very significant numbers of teenagers who are either going with mediators or are sending their proxy patients on their behalf to the facility to, to restock their medicines. And of course this has implications for how an adolescent transitions. Because when this young man wants to go to circumcision school, or if it's a daughter, if she wants to start accessing contraception, um, these adolescents need to transition to being adult caregivers. And when they have a mediator, a caregiver who, who perceives them as a child, who has followed their progress in this close kind of way, who is a kind of authority, there are all kinds of challenges and questions which come from, from transitioning, from having that proxy to being a, a patient principally in, in your own right. The comply or die ultimatum, everyone. I, I was combing through our data last night. This was a really strong finding from reports that adolescents um, were explaining to our researchers. 
or um, from caregivers or healthcare workers. In essence, and Professor Olive Shasana, um, who of course leads the HSRC Household Prevalence Survey, there's a really interesting finding in the most recent survey about a decline in treatment literacy or on an understanding of the kind of biomechanics of HIV and its treatment. We have, in, we have put such rapid numbers, we've had to scale up so rapidly through necessity that our treatment literacy, it's, it's not like what we used to see in Medicine Saint Francier, in Le Siki Siki, or in the Baylor Clinic necessarily. We are, we are seeing massive numbers of people who have to be initiated quickly, option B plus, test, treat, initiate, right? And of course, healthcare workers are doing their best a lot of the time, but there is a kind of truncated treatment literacy where you have to come up with a few messages and get them across very quickly. Why do you have to adhere to your treatment? Because you will die if you don't. And what do we see in adolescents? They start misbehaving, they start questioning. They default from their medicines for a weekend, but Monday morning comes and they're still with us, right? So they've pushed the boundaries of deception and they've understood that they've been lied to. It might be in their best interests, but they start to question, what else is it that I'm being fibbed to about, right? So there's a couple of sources there I'd just like to mention. We've done some research and published a bit on HIV disclosure and what can go wrong when you strategically deceive an adolescent. On positive sexual and social norms, I wanted to raise the work of Catherine Mc McPhail and uh, speak about Audrey Pettifor's work. There is really exciting stuff that's being done in ways to intervene um, in the kind of gendered hierarchy in a way in which you know patriarchal gender norms oppress um, and disempower women. We've been looking at something remarkable that's happened in HIV research. How can we intervene? What kinds of pathways can be changed through, for instance, access to a social grant? Um, and there are questions, of course, about gender social norms. I wanted to share with you a particularly interesting case from a focus group that we did with young men in Eastern Cape. And this is partly about, I think, the beauty and the utility of participatory data. It's also about the positive ways in which young men are reconfiguring or realigning social and sexual norms in ways that could promote uh, positive masculinities. So this was the focus group. Let me talk you through the facilitator's question. He, in essence, asked, how can you get a woman to go to bed with you? And respondent number one explains, well, we can watch pornography. The second respondent explains, um, or he then qualifies, um, if she's not into porn, we can try you know, other kinds of sexual pleasure, potentially foreplay. Um, then the facilitator asks of a younger participant, and you, what about you? And he responds, I can drag her because I don't have another way. And at that point in the, in the focus group, the most remarkable thing happened. I was nowhere in the room, colleagues. This was a conversation between young men who all spoke the same language. They were very, very similar age. Probably the most powerful, he was the eldest and most experienced, and in terms of kind of cultural capital, he was probably the most powerful in the group. He just said three words in response to this, and he said, that's rape, dude. So there's a way in which young men are engaging with each other and that, that that can be used, tapped into, to intervene in troublesome, um, oppressive gender norms, that we can harness that to, to look at how power is shared um, in society and how that can promote better health outcomes. So what do you think, everyone? Please drop me an email. That's our website. Um, we have our latest publications and presentations there. Please get in touch, have a look at our project. And let me say a final thank you to the research team, to our long-suffering, um, very supportive research partners in the Department of Health, Basic Education and Social Development, and our many other research partners without which this, this research would never have been possible. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you.